Welcome to Menopause Reimagined. I'm your host, Andrea Donsky. I'm a nutritionist for more than 18 years and I'm in menopause. I'm a menopause educator, menopause researcher, and I'm the co-founder of wearemorphous.com, a company that empowers you to take control of your health and symptoms with nutrition, lifestyle, supplements, and research. Today, I'm speaking with Natalie Needham. She's a podcast host and longevity biohacker, a holistic nutritionist, human potential, and epigenetic coach. Natalie is a self-proclaimed science geek with a passion for human health. She's a certified holistic nutritionist and an epigenetic coach who focuses on longevity and health span in her work with clients. Today, we're going to cover the topic of peptides. You won't want to miss it. Now, here's Natalie. Welcome to Menopause Reimagined, Natalie. Thank you so much, Andrea. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm excited. I was on your podcast. Now you're on mine. And I wanted you on mine because I've been following you on social media for a while. And I know you are a biohacker. And first of all, I'd love to see that you're a female biohacker because in more and more women, I'm seeing more and more women, but I'd love you to introduce, I did the intro um, before I brought you in, but I would love you to tell everybody who you are and what you do and what got you into this. Sure. Um, so basically, you know, my, my foundation is as a holistic nutritionist. So the biohacking thing is really, you know, it's, it's an interesting thing. It's, it's kind of like a container, right? And within that container, we operate based on our education, our interests, and where we kind of lean towards. And I think what the biohacking title kind of implies is that, and you know, you are a biohacker, even though you don't identify necessarily as a biohacker, you are because we are people who are basically looking for ways to positively affect our physiology and our performance in whatever way we can. And whether yeah. that's lifestyle or behavior or supplements or health technology, all of these things fall under this sphere. And really what it's about, it's about saying, okay, great. You know, I know I got to sleep this, that, and the other thing, but what else, what else is there? And also saying, I know that I can affect my health outcome dramatically by things that I do, things that I use and things that I take that are outside the realm of conventional medicine. We want to hang on to the realm of conventional medicine because there's a lot of good stuff there, yeah. but we don't want to over rely on it simply because conventional medicine, it falls a little bit short when it comes to prevention, when it comes to what can I do to avoid going down this path? Or, mm -hmm. you know, if I did go down this path and let's say I'm I'm pre-diabetic, which so many people are. So many. In conventional medicine, very often they're not going to offer you a lot of tools to prevent that pre-diabetes to turn into diabetes. And you know, and there's a lot you can do. There's there's that that particular cliff is a cliff you can step back from and get off of completely. So anyway, so I kind of got a little off track. So I became a holistic nutritionist. I got very interested also in coaching people and helping people to kind of change their mindset because it doesn't take long as a nutritionist to figure out that there's no shortage of information out there, but helping people to overcome their own inner obstacles to changing their behaviors in a positive way, that in and of itself is a whole other discipline. And, and so I kind of did some training in that area. And then I got very interested in genetics and epigenetics. So I did a bunch of training yeah. there. Then by then I'm like ensconced in this world that is called biohacking. And at that point I came across these compounds called peptides and peptide bioregulators. And, you know, it's funny, I tell this, I've told this story a couple of times where I was at a conference, I sat down because I needed to take a load off my feet. And this guy's talking about these things called peptides. And my jaw was on the floor. I come home from the conference and I tell my husband, oh my God, I just learned about this stuff, these things called peptides. And he's like, dude, you don't need anything else. You know enough, just stick to what you know you're fine. You don't need to fall down <laughs> another rabbit hole. And I was like, yeah, okay, you're right. Yeah, yeah. And I just couldn't like it was like this, this magnet well, that kept pulling yeah. me back. And I ended up subsequently starting a Facebook group, starting a podcast, all to feed the monster of the peptides and the peptide regulators That's in funny. this whole space of longevity. And um, here I am. You know, I so tell us what peptides are explain what they are. And, um, and then I'll ask you lots of questions around that. Okay. So peptides are basically small proteins and peptides over the peptides have been around probably for, for a lot longer than people realize. People think they're very new. Most people don't even know they exist, but for the people who know of them, they think they're very new, but there's a population of people that have been using peptides for quite a long time. 
And those are the people I consider to be the uber first biohackers. And those are bodybuilders, mm. right? Yeah. So bodybuilders, we know, use a lot of steroids and a lot of stuff that is like, oh, scary. But they've also been tapping into the world of peptides for, for a couple of decades. And they, I call them biohackers because these are people that absolutely are in the business of having a massive impact and influence on their body, their body composition, how they look, the, how they perform the whole nine yards. The problem with bodybuilders is sometimes they're a little short-sighted in their methods. Mm -hmm. And so they'll look super awesome for competition. And then you run into them on the street a week or two later and they're a hot mess. Like they're bloated, they're inflamed, their hormones are out of whack. So they will stop at nothing. What's happened over the last, I'd say the last four years or so, is that peptides have been starting to bubble up into the space of not necessarily the mainstream, but let's say the early adopters of the mainstream. They've been, they've moved really into the space of functional medicine, where you have a lot of doctors now who are becoming educated in peptides and starting to love, use them in their practice to get incredible results. Mm -hmm. So what a peptide actually is, is a small protein. And as your followers probably know, or your audience probably knows, proteins is what runs the human body. They're enzymes, they're hormones, they're, they're tissue, they're all the things, right? Proteins can be massive and they're made up of single amino acids that are arranged in a very specific configuration and then folded in a very particular way so that they fit receptors or have certain actions. A peptide is only 50 amino acids are shorter. And the mm -hmm. peptides we're talking about are essentially fragments of naturally occurring proteins in the human body. And they've been isolated and synthesized in a lab. And when they're readministered to the body, they have the ability to trigger a cellular response that gets a cascade going that gives us a desired outcome. So that mm -hmm. desired outcome could be something like... Um, well, actually, one of the most famous peptides, which I would bet you everybody in your audience knows about, is insulin, mm -hmm. right? So we make insulin in our pancreas, but many, many years ago, a guy from Toronto whose name escapes me at this very minute figured out that insulin could be reapplied to people with diabetes right. and it could help their particularly type 1 diabetes where their pancreas has completely failed and they're no longer making insulin, which is a really dangerous thing. But if we give that person insulin by injection, it will do the work and help to put the, the sugar away where, when we're eating glucose, right? So peptides are kind of in that space, but we have different ones that we can use for different functions. So for example, there are peptides that help with immune function. There are peptides that help with repair of, of mm -hmm. tissue, of mm -hmm. the gut lining, of there's other peptides that affect cognition. So there are, actually there's even peptides that have been researched and looked at in the areas of dealing with tumors. Like, you know, I'm trying to not use inflammatory language here, but basically they are, but they are for the most part, they are research chemicals, right? So the lion's share of them have not been approved for human use. And a big part of that reason is because the drug companies have very little interest in doing much work around them because they can't patent them. Now, new new page in the book, there are certain peptides that have been developed by drug companies into drugs. One of them is called PT-141, okay. which is marketed as, you can't remember the name, but it's marketed as a medication for women to, to enhance libido. Hmm. And what's interesting about it is unlike Viagra, that really is just like a pump, like a, it, it affects blood flow. This PT-141 actually works on the brain center that affects libido. It works for men and women. But when the drug company figured out it works for women, they're like, well, we got lots of stuff for men, but girls, we got nothing for them. So they kind of ran with it. They made some modifications to it so they could patent it and they remarketed it as a drug. Okay. The most famous of these other than insulin and well, this one's not famous. It's not actually that well known the most famous right now that are making a lot of noise and creating a lot of kerfuffle in the world are the fat loss peptides, Ozempic, which are Ozempic and, and Mungero, right? Whose chemical names are set, uh, semaglutide and terzepatide. And these have proven to be incredibly effective tools for body recomposition, for fat loss. 
And what the what the drug companies basically did is they had identified compounds in the body like GLP-1 and G1P that have certain effects that they reduce should. appetite, yeah. they reduce food drive, they increase resting metabolic rate, they improve insulin sensitivity, they, they enable people to lose weight. Like they're pretty magical. And they thought, okay, the problem with GLP-1 is if they're one minute gone the next. So when the researchers figured that out, they were like, okay, well, what if we could do something to that GLP-1 and help it to stick around longer? Yeah. And that's essentially what, where like kind of the genesis of these medications. And now it's like a minor that's hit, a, 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 like a minor who's hit a vein of gold, the gold rush is on. Because you've got um, you've got Novos Pharmaceutical that first came out with semaglutide, and they'd come out with a couple of other ones. There's duglutide, liraglutide, but semaglutide was like the big hit. Yeah. Next, hot on its heels was Munjaro with terzepatide, which is a dual in Cretin, so it works through two different pathways. Now there's a third one coming down the pipes called Riditrutide, which I don't know what its brand name is going to be. Still Eli Lilly. That one, I will tell you, when you read the papers about what it does it's almost frightening how fast and effective it is. And they're right now in phase three clinical trials. So we're going to have to see what comes out of this. But definitely, I think, you know, as much as drug companies have spent very little, if any time on things like BPC-157 and thymus and beta-4, which we can talk about later, as soon as, when they saw this thing that works for weight loss, they're like, this is worth our millions and millions of dollars of R&D because this is where the money is, right? Like BPC-157, it heals the gut, it heals musculoskeletal, it, it affects the brain, like it affects lots of different things. And it may be that it's too big a nut for them. And plus there's not the billions of dollars in healing the gut quickly, which frankly, most doctors don't even recognize as an issue versus helping millions and millions of people to drop weight at will. So you're, you're talking about the weight loss drugs. Oh, we'll go there and then, but I, I want to go back to just peptides right after because sure. we're kind of on the topic. Yeah. So as somebody who promotes a natural health style, natural living, mm -hmm. I, you know, when, when these medications first came on the market, I was like, oh, that's really interesting because so many of us need help to yeah. manage blood sugar. The GLP-1 is what's, you know, takes away our appetite. But I also hear that there's a lot of side effects and I hear from, you know, some people, but you don't, I find that I hear about it more from the people in the functional medicine world. I hear about the side effects. So can you talk a little bit about that? Like, are these safe to take? Like, do they come with side effects? Like, so these are, I think for our listeners, because, you know, understanding how they work to help us lose the weight is amazing, but is it something that we, what do, what do we need to be aware of before yeah. we start taking yeah. these medications? That That's a great question. And for sure, a lot of what you're seeing out there is the marketing right? And you're hearing from people who are like, oh my God, I use this for X amount of time and I lost 30 pounds. I feel amazing. I look amazing. I'm so excited. And there's a couple of things to, to be aware of. And I think we're starting to see, I was just talking about this the other day with someone. What we're starting to see right now is when they did their research, they did their research on people who had type two diabetes and or were obese. Right. right. So in that population of people, the two black box warnings that we see, we hear about for both of these compounds is that there's a definite risk of pancreatitis. And I have seen this happen in my community a couple of times. It's not everybody. Nobody really knows why it hits some people more than others. There's a possibility, Andrea, you and I could sit and put our heads together and say, well, probably people who drink a lot of mm -hmm. alcohol, whose pancreas is already struggling Right. might be at higher risk, right? They're maybe already on, on the brink because in some ways it helps the pancreas to work better, right? Mm -hmm. it, it, in some ways it may even be healing in some ways to the pancreas, but yet for some people it can cause pancreatitis and pancreatitis isn't just painful. It's bad news. Don't mm -hmm. want to go there. So there's that. And then the other black box warning is a very rare form of thyroid cancer called medullary thyroid cancer, okay. but it's only ever been observed in rats. So Having said that, as a result, out of an abundance of caution, anybody with a family history or a history of thyroid cancer would be smart to just to stay away from these things. So what's happened now, of course, is word got out. The biohackers got their hands on it. The general, general population started talking to their doctors and saying, well, surely, you know, I've got 20 pounds to lose. Surely you can help me get my hands on this stuff. 
what what I think we've seen over the last couple of years is now it's gotten out into the general population. And now we're starting to hear about some other things. We're mm-hmm. starting to hear about people who've lost muscle. We're starting to hear mm-hmm. about people. Who, yeah, I heard that as well. Yeah. As well as we're starting to hear about people whose stomach has become paralyzed because it slows gastric emptying, right? So is that like gastroparesis? We, like, is that? Yeah, full on oh. gastroparesis. Oh, we're wow. starting to hear about people who have pancreatic insufficiency, which doesn't actually make sense, but, you know, or chronic pancreatitis. So we're starting to hear this stuff. And I think the reason for that is because now the population mm. of people who are using these compounds has gotten way bigger. Right. We're hearing about Ozempic face. Now, the thing about Ozempic face, this is when somebody's, you know, somebody loses a lot of weight in their face. The fact of the matter is that anybody who loses a ton of weight in a short period of time is going to their face is going. And it's a genetic thing. Some people lose weight in their face more than others. Mm -hmm. So I'm like that one. I'm like, punt it to the door. Yeah. The muscle loss. That's really interesting. So here's one of the things that these compounds do is it improves the uptake of glucose at skeletal muscle. Hmm. So you're going to sit there and say to me, well, wait a minute, that should make it easier for people to exercise. That means their muscles are better fueled. And it does. If you're exercising, if you're exercising, I was going to say, (laughs) and if you're eating protein. So one of the things that I think's happened is that you have two populations of doctors that are prescribing this stuff. You have one population that writes out a prescription, says, take this, you're going to lose weight, see you in three months or six months or whatever. And then you have another population of doctors that says, here's the number for my health coach or nutritionist. I need you to work with them because what's going to happen here, you're going to start eating a lot less food. Mm -hmm. And you might just figure out that you can eat Oreos and still lose weight. And you may turn into the toddler that you were however many years ago and say, well, if I can lose weight and eat Oreos day in, day out... I meant sign me up because yeah. most people only change their diet. You and I both know because they want to lose weight, right? Yeah. Well, if yeah. they could hold on to their crappy diet and lose weight, right? This seems like the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. The problem is it's fake gold, mm-hmm. right? It's fool's mm-hmm. gold because if you don't eat a nutrient dentist diet, you don't eat enough protein, which most people don't to begin with. And you don't exercise. The body is super smart. The body is like this muscle stuff super expensive to keep up. We're just going to dump it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're going to sit on the couch eating your Timbits or Dunkin' Donuts or whatever it is. Your muscle is going to waste away. You're going to become nutritionally deficient, right? And then one day you're kind of skin and bones, but you're fitting into your size two or size four jeans. You're super excited. But now you're going to come off this stuff and guess what's going to happen? Your brain's going to wake up and go, we need nutrients and we need them now. And, and it doesn't eat, care how you get them. You're going to eat a lot more. and You're going to eat a ton. You're going to go back to your crappy eating habits. You now no longer have muscle to store glucose in. So mm. it's like this perfect Ooh. storm. Just wow. to keep my language clean, I would normally use a different expression. You can say shit storm. We're, all, we're okay with swearing. All right. Well, it's a complete <laughs> shit storm, right? Like, and it's a predictable <laughs> shit storm. Yeah. So basically what's happened is you've set yourself up for a massive problems down the road. Wow. So what we need to do is people need, so two things. Number one, unfortunately, because this is easy, it is becoming the default. Right. And I just, I just got, I just started working with someone recently who said to me, okay, I have 20 pounds loose. Should I be using terzepatide? I'm like, no, I don't even know what you're eating. I don't Mm. even know what you're doing. We haven't even tried to help your body to release, release extra weight. Right. Why would we why would we go to this high tech solution that has, you know, some known and some maybe unknown downsides before we've actually sat here and said, okay, let's try and change your habits and improve your diet. Because yeah. especially you're a guy, so you're kind of simple. Yeah. <laughs> we love you because you're simple. They lose so fast. <laughs> How many women have you coached who called oh. you three months in saying, I'm going to kill him. He's doing everything <laughs> I'm doing. He's lost 20 pounds. I've lost a pound. It's like, it's ridiculous, the male versus the female body. But anyways, that's all. Anyway, we digress. So, Mm -hmm. so the truth of the matter with the GLP ones is I think for the most part, they are a benefit and they can help with cardiovascular health. They can help with cognition. They're being researched for Alzheimer's. They're, They're beneficial for the, for different organs. But there's a caveat, like you have to eat that nutrient dense diet. You need to eat protein like it's your job. You need to exercise. And so once you do that, and guess what? Here's the other invitation. 
because that food noise, that drive to eat all the time has now been quieted, this is your opportunity to modify your diet and to adopt better eating habits altogether. Hmm. So that one day down the road, you've lost 30 pounds of fat. You may have lost a couple of pounds of muscle, but you're still up. You're still good, right? Because you might still lose a little bit of muscle with your fat. That kind of happens with fat loss. But as long as you're strong and you still have decent lean mass, then and you've got new eating habits and you're sleeping and your lifestyle's fixed and the whole thing, now you can start to wean off these things and go about your life. And then hopefully at that point, so you won't have that shit storm that happens because you've already made the changes and you've already implemented the exercise and the protein. So protein, so we're talking about protein. We always talk about in menopause and perimenopause that we need to eat more protein. We need to have you know 20 to 30 grams of protein per meal. Can we get these peptides from our food alone or from something like collagen? No, not at all. Like collagen is a completely different animal. Like peptides are, you know, and peptides aren't protein per se. I mean, protein is made up of peptides, but pre peptides are signaling molecules, right? So when I'm talking to people about bumping up their protein intake, and particularly when they're using GLP-1 agonists, which are notorious for like slamming your appetite shut. And now you, you definitely don't want a steak or a piece of chicken or a piece of fish. Like you just don't have the appetite for it. Mm. That's where we've got to lean into a little bit some of the more modern day hacks. And we have to get into the world where we're using essential amino acids and a lot of them. Or we might be using a good greens powder and a good reds powder because we want to get that that micronutrient density into you so that you're not de you don't end up depleted on the other side. Right. So I remember years ago taking SON, it was a SON formula, which is yeah, um, that map. Master yeah, amino acid. Yeah, that stuff's exactly. amazing. That's yeah. I mean, this that's the ago. original formula. Yeah, right? I remember that from so long. I remember this man who um who was he would always tell me he was in the natural health industry because I've been in it for so long. He was like, and this was oh gosh, it must have been at least ten years ago, probably more. Yeah. And he was like, he's gonna live till he's one hundred and twenty because he's taking map. He's taking this whole formula. And I was like, what is that? And he gave me a bottle. I remember, and I took it for a while. And I was like, and this was before I was you know really knew much about perimenopause. It's probably even fifteen years ago, and uh, so. I remember, I remember hearing that we should be taking that. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the only problem I have with map, my only objection to them is they're sticky. So you choke. And they're so they, expensive. I find they it's are like expensive. 70 or $80 a bottle. It's so expensive. Oh God, no, no, this no, was no, back no. Then. We need to give you a better source. No, no, okay, no. There's better sources for it. They're Ooh, not cheap, like crazy. but the problem with map. And the thing is that Dr. Grandi and Dr. I think it's Moretti. And they're two Italian guys. They came up with this formula and they're the ones that really came up with it. And now they came off patent and everybody's knocking them off, mm, okay. but they're stubborn, <laughs> so stubborn. And so they, they don't want to change their formula at all. There are, there's one brand in particular where they'll coat the tablet. So it mm. just, it's much easier. The one that I actually have a bottle of map here. The one thing I want to experiment with it is I want to, um, crush it. I want to kind of rub it with, with coconut oil mm. and oh, see okay. if that makes it easier to swallow. Yeah, Cause they because can't, so you, they're not coated. Yeah. So they, it, they're not coated yeah. at all. Yeah. But, but you know, when it comes to map, there was a guy in Toronto that I knew and he passed away a couple of years ago, unfortunately, but, um, he would take, he had, sir, he had had a motorcycle accident and they were rebuilding his arm. And they actually wanted to amputate it at one point. And he's like, no, no, there'll be none of that. You just do what you need to do. I got this. Anyway, so he's in the hospital and he is pounding, I think, 40 to 45 tablets a day. So that's almost a bottle a day. Oh, my gosh. And the doctors are like, we don't want you taking anything. And he's like, yeah. Uh -huh. And so he'd be like, <laughs> he's like hiding yeah. in the corner and he'd have white powder. <laughs> and they'd come in and they'd be like, you're taking that stuff again. He's like, nope, 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 not me. <laughs> oh my God. Anyway, he healed in Too a way fast. that blew them out of the water, right? Yeah. The surgical wound healed, the tissue healed. He's still, I mean, look, there's only so much you can do when you just about ripped your arm off, but the healing that he experienced would never have happened because what you're doing, what are you doing? You're giving your body the building blocks to, to build, to rebuild your infrastructure. I was listening to a podcast about it because I, I got interested after following you and hearing about peptides and, 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 and trying to learn a little bit more about it. And 
I was listening to a podcast and then somebody was talking about how great they are and to take them, but they did, he did say that there was a connection somehow to cancer. Like, do you, have you heard that? No. Okay. Cause I no. remember him saying that it could cause things to grow. And that's when I was like, oh, okay. Like, tell me Not more. So you haven't heard that. Okay. No. Okay, there's no good. way there's i mean that it i mean that is such a stretch okay you know i think you'd be even and i don't believe that meat causes cancer but i would say there's a better case for meat than there is for for essential amino okay. acids okay right i wanted to i wanted to understand that better because as soon as i heard that i'm like oh, you know because i'm always looking for good ingredients to offer to our from our for our line of morphous but as soon as i hear anything that's like yeah. even slightly Maybe related to that or making things grow. I'm like, you know, we go the other direction, but that's why I was curious. No, I would, I would say that for your product line at Morphus, it would be a beautiful addition because good quality essential amino acids. The problem with essential amino acids is they taste nasty when you put mm. them in a drink. There have okay. been, there's one flavor of one brand that tastes good. And, and maybe, you know, there's another brand that makes it in a lemon lime. If you like sour things like I do, yeah, I love that's sour. acceptable. Right. Okay. But otherwise they just, they kind of have a bit of a funky aftertaste. Mm. So the, the tablets are probably the best, like I have a bottle this big and yeah, I just take 10 at a time, okay. <laughs> which is already a double dose. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, isn't it five tablets? I remember taking like it's yeah. five tablets a day. Um, interesting. Well, thank you for that. So uh, what are some other examples of peptides? Okay. So, so in the peptide world, so we'll, we can maybe talk about bioregulators a little bit also, but, but in the peptide world, some of the examples, some of the ones that people maybe have heard of, and the, the unfortunate thing about peptides is that the nomenclature, because they haven't been branded is it's kind of like alphabet soup, right? Mm -hmm. So we have BPC 157, which BPC, actually this one is the best because it's body protective compound 157 and okay. 157 is a designation. I believe it's amino acid number one to number 57 of a bigger protein that is naturally secreted in the gut. Okay. Okay. So we have and these are, and these yeah. are, sorry to interrupt you just so I understand it for no, those no, listening, because when, when you put when you say these, um, these acronyms or the, you know, these yeah. letters, I'm like, okay. Cause my brain goes to, ah, I don't know what, you, what that is. Yeah. So these are products that you, so these are peptides, but are these products that biohackers are taking? Is that it? Yeah. So okay. they are. So BPC-157 is really interesting because it is um, one of the things about peptides, because they are basically proteins, is for okay. the most part, they can't be taken orally. Okay. Because all that's going to happen to them is they're going to get digested just like another protein in your gut, right? Okay. BPC-157 gets a, gets a pass because it is naturally occurring in the gut. So there's there's a, there's something about the way that these 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 amino acids are arranged that allows the body to recognize it as a unit and to basically not just go chopping it up right away. It will eventually break it down, but not okay. immediately. But BPC-157 can be taken orally. It can be used as a subcutaneous injection. It could be used as an intranasal spray, which is really interesting. It can be used topically on wounds and burns. It can be used in specially compounded, and I'm saying specially compounded because don't go doing this at home, but there are compounding pharmacies that can compound it into eye drops and can be really helpful for eye health, for a dry eye, things like that. Thymosin beta-4 okay. is another one that's in that league. Um, and so like, there's any way you can imagine to apply it to the body, there's an application for it if it's properly prepared. So what's nice about BPC-157 is because it can be taken orally, there are a number of, of supplement companies that have now formulated it into okay. supplements. And the okay. two applications you'll find primarily is for gut healing. Right. I, I was going to say, so like, why, I mean, obviously longevity and, you know, we could see for weight loss, we have that one, but what are some of these other reasons that we want to yeah. take, you know, that? Well, exactly. Thing. So where BPC-157 moves the needle for people dramatically is if they have, um, so it has, there is some research around it, around um, um, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's, leaky gut, okay. uh, ulcers in the mouth anal fissures, like mm. any injury you can imagine to that yeah. whole tube that runs from your mouth to your bum, mm -hmm. there's an application for healing for BPC-157. Okay. In addition, BPC-157 is organo, organ, organ protective, right? So it has a protective effect on the pancreas, on the liver, on the heart, on the kidneys. Mm. So 
very often, going back to our GLP-1 agonists, we have physicians who are prescribing BPC-157 in conjunction with the GLP-1 agonists to try mm. and protect the pancreas, right? Um, it has It seems to balance neurotransmitters in the brain for many people. Now, there is a small percentage of people where it has the opposite effect. Nobody exactly knows why that is. Mm -hmm. um, it can help to offset the damage that steroids do to the body because we know that when we inject steroids, um, like for joint or that kind of pain, yay, you feel great, boo, you've now blocked your body's healing capacity. So now mm -hmm. you're going to get, you've silenced the inflammation and the pain, and now you, the degeneration is just going to gallop away. Right? right. So BPC-157 seems to have a bit of a mitigation effect there. It can help to mitigate the effect of heavy alcohol use and NSAIDs. There are some studies that show that it can help protect the brain from TBI. It can help mm. the brain to heal wow. from traumatic, traumatic brain, brain injuries. injuries. Wow, that's yeah. amazing. Um, I'm sure I'm, it's anti-inflammatory. It's analgesic. It is really amazing for healing or promoting the healing of musculoskeletal injuries, so whether that's tendons, ligaments, muscles, hmm. bones, all of those things, it, it sends like a healing signal. So are these to be used on a short-term basis? Like, is that, you know, I think so. I do. Um, so here's the thing, right? I, I probably said this before, but I'm going to say it again. They are not approved for human use. These are research chemicals right? Now, for whatever reason, on the oral side, it seems to be a bit cleaner. Mm -hmm. I did hear once that BPC-157 had been given grass status, which is generally recognized as safe status by Health Canada. I haven't seen anything to that effect, but mm -hmm. I haven't looked either. So okay. somebody just told me that. I was like, oh, that's interesting. Maybe that accounts for the fact that we now have oral BPC supplements that are starting to pop up all over the place. And okay. there's different formulas targeting different things. Definitely the oral is most effective for the GI tract, but it's not unusual for someone to use BPC-157 either by injection or orally for GI issues and to come in three weeks later and go, you know what's really weird? I've had this sore knee or sore back, like fill in the blank for so long. It doesn't and hurt anymore. Yeah. yeah. So it's it's pleiotropic, right? But it also drives angiogenesis, which means you, it- yeah. can you, I was going to say, can we explain that pleiotrope? Like, let's let's explain what that means just so, because okay. they're, yeah. they're big words. So they're big words, sorry. Just so I understand. Yeah, okay. that's okay. And you know what? We we, we have our lingo, right? So yeah, yeah, but yeah, I just yeah. want to make sure we we explain it so that- We bring everybody words. along with us. Yes, yeah, exactly. 100%. No man, no woman or man left behind. Pleiotropic just means that it has many different effects. So it's what I was just describing. It does many different things in the body. The other thing that makes people stop a little bit, but one of the reasons why one of its superpowers of healing tissues that don't get good blood supply is it can help to drive angiogenesis. So that is the growth of new blood vessels. Now, anybody who knows anything about cancer or has dealt with cancer, this is going to be like a big fat red flag just popped up, right? Wait a minute. Tumors drive angiogenesis so that they can bring more blood to themselves for nutrients and whatnot. So while I will say that there's, I have never seen anything that says that it drives cancer, there's still that little concern out there that's like, mm, well, maybe we don't know. I don't know. I'm not sure. So for me with these things, if somebody's going to delve into this area, have your eyes wide open, do your research, find someone who will guide you, preferably find one of the doctors out there now, and there are a lot of them in the functional medicine space who've taken these compounds in and are using them constantly and leveraging them and monitoring everything that's happening with their patients along the way mm. and know that this is like an eight to 12 week run. And then okay. you're going to stop. And then, the, yeah. Sorry for the angiogenesis. You're talking about specifically a type of peptide or you're talking just general. Peptide. No, BPC-157 in particular. BPC-157, okay. So you're talking in particular. Those, I want to be clear. Yeah. Okay. And it's really considered, you know, by many people, one of the safest ones, but, okay. and, and most of them are, as far as we know, very safe. What the, 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 the reason, the reason for caution, if you will, yeah. is the lack of long-term research on yeah. humans. Yeah. And I refer to, like, I actually came up with this analogy just the other day, and it's become my new favorite analogy. And it's a little bit like, you know, when you see those big things of dominoes and you flip one domino and all the dominoes go down kind yep. of thing? Yep, yep. 
so we have a reasonable idea of between the beginning and the end that all the dominoes are going to go down. Yeah. Where I think we may have some blind spots is the side, the sidebar domino chains that may be going down at the same time. Right. And all the evidence so far is pointing to everything being beneficial, but we don't know what we don't know. Yeah. Right. So um, and so we just need to be respectful and mindful. We, we are basically what we're doing is we're giving a stimulus to the body to heal when we know that there's something to heal. And then this is the thing, right? This is not a drug that's suppressing a symptom mm. that you, the minute you stop, the symptom's going to come back. This is not mm. altering a pathway or shutting down a pathway. What this is doing is initiating a healing cascade in the body, mm. which means you need to be, you should be able to stop. And if you can't stop, then you haven't addressed the mechanism that's driving the injury in the first place. So you got to go back to square one and figure out, is it a food? Is it stress? Like, what is it that's causing this damage in the first place? And and I'm so weary about starting and doing anything when you're not working with, like, I'm so happy you said that, like work with somebody who understands it, who's going to test you, who's going to monitor you. Because as we go into perimenopause and menopause, as we age, we are so prone to so many more things. So I'm like, mm. whoa, let's like hold the, you know, let's press the brakes for a minute because what we don't want to do is like you said, we, we know what we know, we don't know what we don't know. So we just like, make sure that if you're going to try it, you're working with somebody that you're working with someone who really understands what they're doing. <laughs> so that way you're, you know, you're in the right hands and that you're not guessing at anything because that yeah, I know. just, yeah. The people that blow me away the most, and I say this with love and Kindness <laughs> and kindness um, are people like in the Facebook group who will, their first post will be, I'm new to this group. I just bought this peptide. What do I do with it? Yeah. I'm like, oh my God, what do you mean you just bought this peptide? What do you do with it? What because do you, somebody told you to this take This is your it. Like, body. Like, know. this that is like, you get one shot, sister. You only get one body. <laughs> like, it, like the stakes are high. <laughs> it drives, yeah, that's, that's a whole other conversation. And it drives me crazy because it's like, I always say this story that on, you know, on social media, there was this trend not too long ago where there was, it was going around that if you want to reverse gray hair, take large amounts of copper, like take copper. Yeah, I know. <laughs> For those of you who are listening, you can you did not see what Natalie just did. She literally just hit her head going, whoa, what? Think of that emoji with the emoji with the head. Face pump. <laughs> yeah, the face pump. Thank you. And it's like, take a lot of copper. Well, you can take a lot of copper because then you're going to throw zinc at it. Like, it's just, oh my gosh. And I'm just like, no, 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 stop. Like, we have to do the research, which is why I'm so that's why when it comes to Morphous products, like I just like, I'm over the top with all my research and I just like, just 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 yeah slow just down be careful what slow, you're, down. Yeah, slow down yeah. and, and just be careful with what you're taking <laughs> like, and copper is one of those things you may already be copper toxic right? and then you're gonna go take more so because you get rid of the gray hair it's just it's it's yeah and then you're gonna go cuckoo and yeah. everybody's gonna say i have a friend oh, she got dementia <laughs> i have a friend who had talk who had copper talk um poisoning from her iud she mm -hmm. had let it in it she had let it, left it for too long and ended up getting all these crazy symptoms they finally figured out what it is. Yeah. So we have to just be really careful when you're playing with things. I, I want to go back for a minute to Ozempic and to um, sure. we'll go over. Okay. So one of the things that I've heard um, from friends, just from personal friends that I have, I've heard like very, very positive. And then I've heard, you know, not so positive. So one of the things that I've heard from my friend who, from the positive standpoint, she said she lost like 20 pounds. She feels great, very happy. But one of the things she recommends is that you always take fiber with it because it oh, can constipate yeah. you. So she was saying, so a lot of, uh, you know, it's so funny. It was not funny, but it's like, we sell so much fiber us for what to women who are on Ozempic on, on these peptides, because it really messes with digestion and, and their constipation. So I'm just going to say for those of you who are considering it or, or who are taking it, just make sure you're eating your 25 to 35 grams of fiber, get something like fiber us to help you go to the bathroom. That's gentle, really important. The well, other and I, if I could add to that a little yeah, bit yeah, too, please. because the mechanism of action, what's happening there is it's slowing everything down. So there's a couple of points there is that, so it's slowing gastric emptying and it's slowing motility of the entire GI tract. So not only do you want fiber, but you want to be taking, probably you want to be taking digestive enzymes because for the most mm. of us, whether we're perimenopause, premenopause, any, frankly, anybody over 40, we're not making as many digestive enzymes as we used to and as we need. Yes. So you probably need to take digestive enzymes as well so that at least the food that's sitting there is digested and is, you know, once it finally moves through, it's it's in the chime, it's in the right stuff that it absorb. needs to be. You'll get it absorbed. You got to make sure you hydrate because if you mm. take a lot of fiber and you don't hydrate, Mm, that's not going to work. 
and you need your your healthy fats at least a little bit and finally you got to take care of your microbiome mm. like you got to be on a decent probiotic that's going to help that micro microbiome balance so I'm so happy you brought that up because because these are the things we need to understand and explain to people so that they understand, yeah, I need fiber, I need digestive enzymes, I need to make sure I'm drinking enough. Like how many women do you know next to not not next to not having enough protein, they don't drink. They don't drink because they don't think about it and because they don't want to have to go to the bathroom all the time. Well, and that's a big deal for many of us who are peeing or, you know, going to the bathroom a lot more often. But I I talk about that a lot in terms of making sure you're drinking. Try to get half your weight in ounces. And it doesn't only have to be water. It could be soups. Mm -hmm. It could be vegetables. Like there are so many other ways to get that intake. But yes, hydration is so important for so many different things, including energy and brain health and all of that other stuff that we know in skin hydration. So it's very important that we get enough. So I appreciate you saying that. Actually, one of my favorite things these days and I we are going to launch it as a Morpheus um, product coming up I'm hoping 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 in the fall if not the fall then it'll be early next year is HCL hydrochloric acid and nice pepsin. it is my favorite and we do you know we have on our website we talk about HCL challenges I love that you're a nutritionist by the way so you're like <laughs> you're like you're talking my talk right like we, yeah. we're we're the same I'm a nutritionist as well so it's more like when it comes to digestion I'm really loving HCL lately especially for women in perimenopause and menopause because like you said, as after the age of 35, our, our acid goes down, our hydrochloric acid, our stomach acid decreases. So, and it's really important that we have hydrochloric acid and pepsin enough to be able to break down our food and absorb our food. So love that you mentioned it. Um, did you want to add to that before I wanted to say the other thing that I heard about the, uh, about no, it? why don't you say, I'm, I might say it. So why don't you go ahead okay, and say perfect. the other thing? <laughs> so the other thing that my friend told me about said that she tried it and for two weeks and for two weeks, she literally was throwing up and was very nauseous. That's, that was the other thing I was going to say. Yes. Yeah. So two things. Number one, it's really important to start at the lowest possible dose and allow your body to acclimatize. However, there are people who do not tolerate it, period. They just don't, even at the tiniest little dose, they don't tolerate it. And the problem is they almost always have a friend who lost 20, 30 fill in the blank pounds and they are hell bent. This is going to work for me. I'm going to keep using this if it kills me, which it could. So, I mean, it won't, but you know what I mean? So mm. bottom line, be prepared that there's a possibility that you won't tolerate it. Now, there are people who do not tolerate semaglutide who tolerate terzepatide, which is Monjaro better. Okay. So there's a possibility that you can, if hopefully you got your prescription from your doctor, that you might be able to switch over to Munjaro. Um, okay. And um, and that and that might not affect you the same way. The other side effect that people report that can be a thing for some people is fatigue. Semaglutide, mm. for some reason, in some people, makes them unbearably tired. Oh my gosh. And add that onto this number one symptom of perimenopause and menopause, 72% of women are already beyond exhausted. So that's interesting. So if somebody... So obviously once they start taking it, if they notice a difference in how they're feeling, like, so what do they look like? I guess, what are you looking for to see if that's, if it's right for you or not? Well, you'll just notice that you're just dragging your bum. like Even more just, so like, than you were before. You're just really exhausted. Like you'll notice a very big change in, and it's not, and I'm not going to say it's uncommon. Like it's not the majority of people at all. It's, I don't even think it's 20%. I mean, I don't actually know the number, okay. but it's not a lot of people, but okay. it's not an insignificant. It's not, I wouldn't call it rare either. So your body for any number of reasons that we may or may not know may simply not tolerate this compound. And therefore you're, I mean, it sucks because, you know, as much as I say, use it not as your first line of defense, use it down the road. For resistant weight loss, it is really quite incredible. Hmm. It, it if, really is. What if somebody wants to try it for like a month, like and just be like, you know what, I have five pounds to lose. Do are do well? Obviously, aside from the fatigue or the nausea or any of that, could that could will that be less of a chance of them having pancreatitis or having any type of like those? Is it a longer term effect that where they're um, seeing those negative side effects? So I don't think so, because I think that the people in my, in the community who had got pancreatitis, actually, it was triggered pretty early in the game. Oh, really? And I will also okay. say that typically the first month you're at the lowest dose. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I never, I did use semaglutide for a while and I did use terzepatide. Semaglutide, though the starting dose is 0.25 milligrams, and then you go up to 0.5, then 0.75. I think the top end is 2.4. I never went above 
I was at 0.75 maybe for a couple of weeks, but I never went above 0.5. I would say the entire duration of my time on semaglutide, the lion's share of it was at half a milligram. And mm. I could have gone higher and lost weight faster, but I had no, no interest in doing that, right? I'm like, to me, what you want to do is you want to find that minimum effective dose that's going to get the needle moving for you so that your body can gradually adapt to the weight loss. What's happening, I think, is people are jumping in at a very high dose. They're trying oh, wow. to drop a bunch of weight fast. Hmm. And you know what? The body's got mechanisms in place to avoid that because from a from an evolutionary perspective, this is a freaking problem, right? It, 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 and so the body has mechanisms in place that says, no, 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 no. We need to get that back. By losing the weight very slowly over a long period of time, you're actually giving the body a chance to hopefully at some point reset your set point so that you're, it's not always fighting to get back there. It also takes time for the effects to show up. So I'll talk about me. Like I used it for a month at 0.25 milligrams. Nothing happened. Mm -hmm. I went up to 0.5 milligrams. I think for another two, three weeks, probably not a whole lot happened again. And then all of a sudden I woke up one morning and it was like, oh, my pants are loose. The heck happened all of a sudden. So it, 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 give yourself, give your body grace and respect, like allow this process to happen over a period of time. It's not a jump in for a month and come out necessarily. I mean, if your body is very sensitive in response to that lowest dose and you drop five pounds, amazing, but you can't count on it. How long should somebody stay on it for? Like, I mean, is this something that women stay on for a year or two? Like, I guess it's, it's, is it? So the studies that were done were pretty long-term. They were like a year, over a year. Now, okay. we take that with a grain of salt. Number one, because drug companies are very invested in people using their products for as long as humanly possible. <laughs> right. um, and they were also dealing with people who were very obese and type 2 diabetic. Yeah. So these are people that had a lot of metabolic dysregulation and it, yeah. nothing was going to resolve overnight, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, and especially because I don't think they particularly encouraged them to do much of what we talked about earlier, like yeah. changing their diet and the whole nine yards. So on paper, they are they should be pretty safe for long-term use. This is, again, an area where I think we're going to learn as we go. Okay. Right? I do know people that, that microdose, that, that are on a baby dose, or once they hit their target rate weight, they start to spread out the time between um, injections. And it bears mentioning this is a once-a-week injection. So that's the other magic of this stuff is that once a week you get a little poke and you're done. And you have to go to a doctor to get it done? Nope, self-administered. Oh, just it's like self just like a diabetic okay. would self-administer insulin, right? These are mm. it's a subcutaneous injection, so it's not in a vein, it's super easy, just in subcutaneous fat. And what are the costs? So, that's a really good question. Um if you can get your insurance to cover it, the costs I'm sure are very manageable. But that involves getting your doctor to prescribe it to you. <laughs> Right. The people who've gone, I'll call it rogue, um, uh, are getting it from research labs and it's not cheap. Even, mm -hmm. even now it's not nearly as expensive as if you were buying it from Novos. Like I think you're talking about 1800 bucks a month or something like it's a ton of money, mm -hmm. but from a research lab, I know I'm not up on my prices, but it depends on your dosage. Mm. right? Because you're, you'll buy, right. let's say a three milligram vial, let's say it costs you 150 bucks. Well, if you're on a 0.25 or a 0.5 milligram dose, it's going to be, it's going to last a long time. If you're, and that's for semaglutide, which is Ozempic. Um, so if you're at a 1.5 or two milligram dose, it's going to last you a week, right? Right. Munjaro, which is terzepatide, now the dosages, it's it's a one to five ratio to semaglutide. So the dosages are 2.5 milligrams to start, then it goes, then you build up from there. Mm -hmm. And again, it's it's kind of in that same realm. I think terzepatide is a little bit more expensive. And again, now you are either, your doctor is sourcing it from a compounding pharmacy, which obviously would be the next best thing to get it, then getting it from the drug company. And then we've got a number of, research labs out there that are, I, in my opinion, playing with fire because mm -hmm. these are patented compounds. So it's only a question yeah. of time before the drug companies turn around and go, yeah, no, we don't know. You can't do that. Yeah. 
Well, being who I am and being who you are as yes. a holistic nutritionist, we've got to talk about natural ways, natural supplements. Sure. So, you know, what, so what are some, like, I, we know, you know, and, and this is not true. I actually, I want to do a video on this where people all over social media are like, oh, berberine, it's the natural azempic. It's not the natural azempic in this. Yeah, exactly. I'm like, yeah. it drives me crazy when I see that. And I actually want to do a video, like I said, to, to, to address it. But mm -hmm. I do love berberine because berberine is amazing for balancing blood sugar. But yes. it's, you know, it's, it's, it's gonna, it has its own things that it works on, it works on. But why don't we talk a little bit about natural supplements that can help? So there are, I mean, there's berberine, there's uh, definitely can help with balancing blood sugar if that's an issue for you, right? Yes, but it exactly. may not be, that may not be your problem. Like there, I think that what's important to under for all of us to really understand and get our heads around is that there are many different reasons for the body to resist releasing weight, right? Um, there's hormone imbalances, which, you know, we are the card carrying members of once we hit <laughs> perimenopause and menopause. And frankly, even before that for a lot of women, right? Yeah, like a lot of younger women struggle because their hormones are out of whack. And there's a lot of reasons for that. So to go the natural route, unless you just decided to eat cheesecake for breakfast, lunch, and dinner with whatever, you know, with your pasta for three weeks out of character, you might be able to just stop doing that, change your diet and move more and you'll drop the weight. I would say that's, that's 1% not... of the population. <laughs> say, that, right? That's not happening for so many of us, no. but, um, but, and, but and in... we are so much more prone to blood sugar dysregulation as we get into percent of life. Well, so we become, like, we become yeah. insulin resistant as we go yeah, into menopause, exactly. like it yeah. automatically it's, it's yeah. a, it's a happening thing. There are a couple of good <clears throat> formulas on the market that I really like um, that, that take, a number of innovative compounds. And actually there's a new one out that has a peptide in it called DNF10 that helps to suppress appetite. Mm. And so that leveraged with changing your diet, eating protein first, eating a low glycemic diet. You don't have to go keto ladies. Keto is going to work for some people, not for others. Yeah, not Long term, menopause, it's yeah. going to turn around and bite you at some point. Yeah. So eating a low glycemic diet, addressing the microbiome, right? Mm -hmm. Doing a test that looks yes. at what are the gut bugs that are living in there? Do you have any acromantia at all? And if you don't, there's ways to feed acromantia. There's now supplements that provide acromantia. feeds acromantia. A hundred percent. As do apple peels. Honest. But here's the thing about acromantia. You shouldn't have to take it indefinitely, right? Mm. If what you're doing is reintroducing it into the gut, and doing the smart things like whether it's berberine or apple peels and feeding acromantia, what the hope is that you're going to help it to get established and regrow. It's like a garden where you've lost one kind of flower. You replant the flower and you make sure that you feed it and you keep the weeds away, right? Yeah. You discourage yeah. the, the more invasive species and hopefully it'll flourish. So assuming it's a perennial, you don't have to replant it every year. I think that certain types of exercise can be helpful, but it, again, it depends on your cortisol. What's the state of your adrenals? What's the state of your thyroid? If your body is already tapped out from dealing with this storm of changes in menopause, beating yourself up and dragging yourself to the gym every day at six o'clock in the morning is not necessarily going to be the thing that helps you to lose the weight. Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I think that obviously eating that whole food, low glycemic diet, understanding if you have any food sensitivities that you need to be mindful of. Um, if you have, if you have leaky gut, taking care of that is going to be really helpful as well, because it's going to help inflammation to come down. It's going to help your immune system to like kind of stand down a little bit to yeah. allow your body to function better. You know, I, there's a reason why people are running in droves to semaglutide and, and terzepatide. It's because weight loss is really kind of it, 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 if, if only it was eat less, move more, the oh, world, would, you know, like there'd be <laughs> billions of dollars that aren't being made out there. Right. Yeah. But it's not. Yeah. And it's really working with someone to help you to understand what are of all the, of, out of the constellation of reasons why your may, body may be hang, hanging on to weight, which could even include things like mold and Lyme and, you know, certain infections that are living in Ebo. your body yeah, where, exactly. yeah. And where your body is like hanging on to this stuff because it's stashed a bunch of toxins in there. And it's like, well, we can't let this stuff go because all hell is going to break loose. So, you or know, thyroid. understanding thyroid's another one. Yeah. yeah. So all of the, so, so understanding, 
like to me, it's so disrespectful to people who struggle with weight loss to say to them, all you got to do is change your diet. Oh, a gas, the gaslighting for women oh. in menopause and menopause is so the amount of comments I hear on my page about eat more, you know, they're being told to eat more, uh, to eat less and exercise more. I mean, it's so insulting <laughs> to, to us, you know, and you know, what's interesting is a couple it was last year, last year, I had a bout of Hashimoto's and I didn't know. Wow. And that's why I'm always, I always tell women to always go get their thyroid checked. And I've always been, even, you know, in perimenopause, I had gained quite a bit of weight. I think it was like 20 pounds at one point. Mm -hmm. And I would, you know, gain eight, eight to 10 pounds. I'd lose eight to 10 pounds. Like it was a constant uh, seesaw yo-yo. Like all the time I was, you know, weight was an issue when I was in peri, but I didn't even know I was in peri. So it was like, I'm like, what's happening to my body? Why is it also doesn't happening? help? Exactly. You know, I knew nothing. So now that's why I'm so adamant about talking about it and sharing. But last year, so when I got into menopause, my body, you know, evened out and I had lost my weight. And I'm generally, I, I was generally the same weight for a long time. And then last year I had a Hashimoto's and I lost, and I didn't know, and I lost 20 pounds within two months. A guy had lost a, and that's why you're talking about quick weight loss. Mm -hmm. So I had lost very my weight really, really quickly. And I went down to, I was like, yeah, I wasn't well, I couldn't get out of bed. It, it manifested as anxiety, heart palpitations, mm. hoarse voice. Like it was super interesting how it manifested in menopause versus before. So, um, and that's, you know, that's a conversation for another day, but in terms of gaining back the weight. So I had gained back the 20 pounds, you know, I got healthy and I, I got gained back the weight and then I gained an extra 10 pounds. And what's mm. so interesting for me is that my body, and you're talking about when you talk about losing weight quickly, and I want to add to what you were saying is that our body does have a built-in mechanism. And when our body loses weight really quickly and you gain back the weight that you lost, you're going to gain extra pounds because your body's going to, uh, 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 I'm not letting that happen again. This is I'm insurance gonna... weight. <laughs> exactly. I'm going to keep that weight on so that you are not. And if you do lose the weight again, you've got an extra padding on there. So I just want to mention that too, because it's important to note. And I now have an extra 10 pounds, which I didn't have before. And it's interesting to understand how the body works. So one of the things I, I hear women say a lot to me as well is you have to, you know, watch how much you're eating, you know, and yes, it can work for some people, but a lot of us aren't eating enough. And mm -hmm. I feel like that's a big issue for us in perimenopause and menopause too, where there where, you know, we're like, but I, I don't understand why I'm not losing weight because I don't eat a lot. But in, in some cases you may not be eating enough and enough of the yeah. right type of foods, like you're talking about protein. So I, I just wanted to add that in too, because I do think it's an important thing for us to understand how the body works. Yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, and definitely eating the wrong foods is not going to help, right? Eating, eating not enough, eating too. And there are definitely people who eat too much. I mean, I'm sure you've done this exercise with your clients where you're like, okay, I'd like you to keep a food diary for a week because people come in and they say, look, I'm, I've gained all this weight. I can't lose it. I don't understand why I eat a super healthy diet. And you're like, okay, I don't not believe you, but I need you to write it down for me. And mm. they come back a week later and they're like, holy jumping. I had no idea. I don't stop eating all day. I couldn't get away from that app. Every 10 minutes I was entering something else in and they don't realize that, you know, their diet skews heavily into one direction and they're lacking in another direction. So getting clarity over exactly what you're eating and where it's coming from. And when you're eating too. And when thing. you're eating, if you're eating right before bed, I mean, these are these are kind of like, they seem like basic things, but frankly, we don't realize when our habits start to slide how much they slide, how fast. We have the luxury in Canada of being able to go to Costco and get a continuous glucose monitor so that we can stick a, this thing on the back of our arm and start to get insight over, you know, is this banana helping me to stabilize my blood sugar or does this banana turn me into a diabetic in 10 minutes? Like, and both may be true depending on your particular physiology and your microbiome and all these different things that we talked about. So there's nothing that replaces the basics. And I think one of the biggest yeah, dangers of these fat loss peptides is that we're now skipping over the basics because we can basically hijack the process and force the body to lose weight. Yay. Until hmm. the day you don't want to be spending a few hundred bucks a month anymore, or, you know, you, hmm. God forbid, you have some kind of a bad side effect and you can't use them anymore. And now where are you? So... Hmm. I'm not, I, I don't want to discourage people from using them because I think they have a place and there's a time and there are people who I've seen who have, were doing everything right. They had done all the work and they still couldn't get, they couldn't convince their body to release the fat yeah. and this thing finally helped them to do it. 
but don't think that it's going to be the one thing you ha- it's not a silver bullet even though it looks like a silver bullet it smells like a silver bullet it flies yeah. like a silver bullet it's not well i w- my business partner randy and i have been really actively looking for some ingredients for a product that we can launch as part of morphis to really help with glp1 so i'm hoping in the next year or two we have something but in the meantime you know natalie talked about a lot of great products that you could check out um, we can link to our the Morpheus products below that I mentioned and some of the products that you talk. I appreciate you being on the show, Natalie. Is there anything that we didn't talk about that you would love to leave our listeners with? Um, well, we didn't talk about bioregulators, so we'll have to save those for another day, um, I think. <laughs> you got it. Um, because I think, I think that's a whole other area okay. of peptides that in some ways is has more human research behind it and is more... I was going to say more safe, but it is almost, it, it, it's not that it's safer, but it's a little less controversial. So okay. I think some other time we might want to talk about that. But other than that, I think that, I mean, I love the work that you do. I love that you. you have your arms and your big, beautiful heart around all these women who, you know, who suffer really unnecessarily. And we just, mm-hmm. you know, as a sisterhood, we have to support each other and, and help each other through this transition in life, which for whatever reason, I mean, frankly, we get abandoned on all the transitions, right? We, mm. Women don't get enough support through pregnancy very often. They don't get enough support through, Lord knows they're not getting enough support as teenagers as they go through puberty and doctors are just writing prescriptions for birth control pills to make their cramps go away. Like as women for ourselves, for each other and for our daughters and our daughter's daughters, like mm. we kind of have to come together and really support each other and educate each other and ask the right questions and look for all the different ways that we need to help each other to kind of manage these transitions. Because, you know, the objective now is we talk about longevity, but we really talk about health span. So living a long time actually isn't that hard anymore. Living healthily for a long time, that's the trick, right? Having our wits about us, being able to go out and enjoy, enjoy our families, our friends, our lives, that's the thing that we all want and that's achievable, but it's, you know, it's the kind of thing we have to start planning for now. We're laying the groundwork now so that our sixties and our seventies and our eighties, and if we're lucky, our nineties are spent being vibrant and, and contributing in whatever way we can to the world around us. First of all, beautifully said, um, I've been listening to this podcast that I absolutely love and it's Julie Louis Dreyfus and she, it's called Wiser Than Me. And oh, nice. she interviews <laughs> Jane, she interviewed Jane Fonda, Carol Burnett, um, Isabel Alande. I think I, I'm, that's, I, I, I know we talked about it on your podcast when I was there and I mentioned this to you. I think that's how you pronounce her name. It's Alande or Ayande. And all these women like, and we're going to end it the same way we ended your podcast when I was on yours is that we have to prepare. Like you, it's, and and they all said the same thing. So when Julia would ask them what the trick was to them living and flourishing in their eighties and their nineties, they all said that it wasn't an overnight thing. It was something that they really instituted early on. And I thought that was super brilliant and interesting because that's what you and I talk about all the time. So it's nice to see and to hear from women who are thriving in their eighties and nineties. I mean, Carol Burnett is 90. Like it's, it's, you know, I, I was listening to that interview. I'm like, oh my God, I love her. <laughs> She's amazing, right? Like, I mean, of course we love her, but really listening to how lucid she is and she's got her wits about her and she's funny at 90. And I'm like, she's my inspiration, you know, Jane Fonda, 85. I'm like, these, these women are our inspiration. So uh, yes, to what you just said, I totally <laughs> agree as well. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. This has been a great conversation. I can't believe we live in the same city and we finally connected. I know. And we are going to meet in person. It is 100%. a goal. So we will meet in person. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I would love to have you back to talk about the bioregulator. So thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Andrea. I hope you enjoyed my interview with Natalie. I know it was a little bit more technical than we normally talk about here on our podcast, but I thought it was in a really important conversation to have because these weight loss drugs are super popular and I wanted to understand them a little bit better. If you enjoyed my conversation, please share the interview because the more you share shows you care and please leave a review because I'd love to read what you have to say about our podcast, Menopause Reimagined. Thank you for spending the last hour and a bit with me. I appreciate you and I'll see you at the next interview. 